The next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Bilal Hamid. Um, he has uh, been with us uh, the last six years, have been a pretty amazing journey, right? Um, so Bilal is currently the uh, Director of uh, Transplant Hepatology Fellowship uh, and Associate uh, uh, Chief of the Liver Clinic and uh, um, Bilal has, you know, also has a lot of passion about you know, looking at quality measures in the practice of, uh, in an academic setting, and he's received award for some of the innovative ideas that he had. So, um, Brian has really done very well, and he also has been very busy running clinical trial. He's the uh, PI for the uh, NIH-funded uh, acute uh, liver failure study group, and he's also very actively involved in the NASH CRN, so that's what, uh, uh, Bilal is going to talk about today about the treatment landscape uh, for NASH. Bilal. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you, Francis. Uh, it's always, uh, you know, I think we won't be talking about eradication of NASH, at least uh, after Nora's eradication of hepatitis C. Uh, it's always uh, get nervous when. Uh, Tony is sitting as one of my mentor who uh, talk, uh, taught me a lot and made me more interested in this field. So uh, Marion just came and told me that you have to finish in 20 minutes. She's looking at her clock and she started the stopwatch. <laughs> and uh, it's hard to talk about so much things going on in fatty liver disease and NASH. So I'll try to make it brief and give a landscape. So there are so many things. And so we were gonna talk about uh, outline uh, mainly before we talk about any clinical studies and how we have to uh, read any of the trial, we need to know what NASH histology mean and how we have to look at the clinical trials and what are the designs of the trial. We need to look at what are the current therapies which are available and also what are the pathogenic pathways and potential targets. And then I'm going to talk about some of the four medications or five medications which I think are more interesting and more in the higher in the clinical phases. So first of all, uh, when you talk about NASH, we have to divide into two categories. One is the NAFO, patients who only have steatosis. And those are the patients which we believe they're non-progressive disease and at this time, based on our understanding, that they don't need any treatment. But patients who have active inflammation, ballooning, and especially fibrosis are the one that we consider them for treatment. Therefore, still, the liver biopsy becomes the gold standard to understanding which group these patients are. The NASH histology, which the NASH CRN came in in 2005, this is a sentinel papal, and that is actually look for more understanding for clinical trials and look at the NASH histology. I think Ryan Gill, who is standing, who is part of our NASH CRN pathology, but the important point to note that, that this NASH uh, score has a steatosis, ballooning, and inflammation. And the score goes from zero to eight. And NASH, or definitive NASH, is if you have a score greater than five. And the borderline NASH, what we call, is the score of four. If you have a score less than three, that person does not have NASH. And when you look at the clinical trials, they have different designs and different categories. They use it, how we define the primary outcomes. The most important thing on a liver biopsy is liver fibrosis. This is an amazing study by late Paul Angolo. And they had these patients, about 619 patients, followed for about 13 years. And they found out that the single more important thing in the liver biopsy is the fibrosis. And patients who had fibrosis, they did worse than patients who did not have fibrosis. And these are the patients who actually don't even have their patients in this group that have just NAS without having NASH. So there's no active inflammation, but if they had fibrosis on the initial biopsy, they actually did not do that well. So therefore, any of the clinical trials, we have to look at it, we have to see that how many patients with fibrosis were included in the clinical trial, and what was the response of that medication on the fibrosis. When we look at the clinical trials, the two most important definitions that we have to look at it, the some trials look at resolution of the NASH. 
So the resolution of NASH is that if someone has a NASH score of greater than four or five, that at the end of the clinical trial, the NASH score is less than three, with no worsening fibrosis. The second, which is mostly used by our NASH CRN, is improvement of NASH score of two or more points with no worsening fibrosis. And that improvement has to have in more than one category. So you can have improvement in steatosis, ballooning, or imp improvement in inflammation. So these are the two more important definitions that have been used. And uh, when I show the clinical trials, you will gonna get an idea that what it means and how many people are able to achieve that primary outcome. But we need more different criteria or design endpoints. So latest studies are focusing on this MR spectrography or MRI, which is also fat fraction. So a couple of studies we are doing is using as the initial and the primary endpoint. And these are pretty interesting. They can look at the fibros and they look at the fat and all over the liver and also can help us an idea that where the fat is and it does not get affected by blood vessels or anything. But it's still in the early phase. Some of the trials just use ALT improvement as the primary outcome. We're also doing trials in patients with cirrhosis. And there is a whole conference that happened that when you're doing a trial in cirrhosis, what would be the primary outcome? And then there are a lot of different discussion, but the most important thing is whether you can improve their portal pressure. And therefore, most of these trials we do, they have a baseline pressure check measurement, and we do it at a periodic interval. At the same time, when you enroll anyone with cirrhosis, what will be their outcome? their debt, their decompensation, what the MEL score. So these are the endpoints that we're still working. But at this time, we don't know what will be the best outcome for any of the NASH study. And therefore, we're still in the very early phase. And the problem is that unlike hepatitis C or other thing, we don't have an SVR, we can say that you achieved this and you can. Even the resolution of NASH, we don't know what will be the long outcome of that importance of this. So we need to better understand these clinical outcome. So what do we have available right now? What we can give to our patients? So there are three main things. What is the lifestyle modification, vitamin E, and pioclitosol? When you look at the lifestyle modification, this is an important study which was, uh, uh, they divided patients into two categories. One is just the regular control arm and they told they met with a dietitian, they told them to lose weight, which most of us do that. But we know that most of our patients are unable to lose weight. In this, the second arm was they actually had met with a dietitian on a regular basis. They have to have a 1,000 to 1,500 calories per day. They have a pedometer, they have to walk 10,000 steps per day. What they found out that average there was 9.3% weight loss in the lifestyle group. And also, when you lost about 7% of your weight, you did have improvement in your NAS activity score. There's more and more data that if you lose 5% of your body weight, you improve the steatosis. If you lose 7% of your weight, you started lose having improvement in inflammation and NAS score, and 9 to 10% when you start having improvement in the fibrosis. So the pivotal uh, paper from NASH CRN, which Dr. Bass was one of the authors, and from our NASH CRN, the primary outcome in this PIVNS trial was decrease in the NASH score by two points with greater than one point decrease in ballooning and no worsening of fibrosis. And the three-arm study, vitamin E, placebo, and pioclitazone. So this was the reason we recommending vitamin E it achieved the primary outcome in 43% in vitamin E group. Placebo has 19% and the pioclitazone arm has 34%. The problem was that, that when you look at the primary outcome, there has to have one decrease of one point in ballooning. But when we look back, when the central pathologists look at the studies, that there were more patients in the pioclitazone arm who did not have ballooning on the initial biopsy. So they cannot reach the clinical outcome. The other definition is resolution of NASH. So if you look at the resolution of NASH, 47% patient in pioclitosal arm and 36% in vitamin E had resolution of NASH. So pioclitosone did work, but I will talk about what are the issues with both of these medications. 
So summary of the current recommendation in NASH. So if you have intervention and improvement of NASH or weight loss, 5 to 10 percent, vitamin E, 800 are used per day, or pioclitazone. There are other studies using pioclitazone, 45 milligram, actually shows that it act Im can improve fibrosis. Interventions that can lead to resolution of NASH, again, weight loss, 5 to 10 percent, vitamin E, and pioclitazone. And interventions that can improve the fibrosis is weight loss and pioclitazone. But there's no long-term data on these interventions and clinical outcome. But there are a lot of limitations. The weight loss, as we know, is very difficult to induce and even more difficult to maintain. The vitamin E can increase the risk of bleeding and in a dose-dependent manner that can be starting at about 400. We have patients who are on vitamin E for 10 years now, and we don't know what will be the long-term outcome, how long to continue. We don't have any long-term data on it. There is a paper, a uh, selenium trial, which shows that in older men, vitamin E increased the risk of prostate cancer. Vitamin E also can increase the risk of hemorrhagic stoke. The bioclitazone, the main problem is weight gain. The different studies in our PIVNS trial, the average weight gain was about five kilogram, and also increased the risk of bone fractures. It's a black box warning for bladder cancer or cardiovascular disease, mainly heart failure. So we need more treatment. As we know, there is no FDA approved medication for NASH. There are more clinical trials, there are more medications coming in than our scandal for our presidential campaign every day. So you can imagine that how many medications are out there now. So, but before we go, uh, this was, uh, it's a complicated, so, but Nora and I had this paper, uh, it's article published in clinics in liver disease, and we actually tried to make this diagram to get an understanding of what, but it gets more complicated when we are making. We have to take something out. But the bottom line is that there is not only in the liver. There are a lot of things going in the intestine. This affects our lichen. There are other uh, hormones that release from the intestine. The adipose tissue where start the peripheral insulin resistance. So the medications that we are working with, working in a lot of different pathways. But to simplify how we look into these agents and how the pathogenesis work, this was a much simpler way to understand. So when you have genetics, micro microbiome, and behavior, everything can lead to insulin resistance. So one class of medication that we are working with is our insulin resistance that improve insulin sensitivity. Then it can cause steatosis, increase free fatty acid, and then ultimately the inflammatory pathway get activated. And that can cause stellate cell activation, apoptosis, and cell death. So the other classes are inflammatory agents, the apoptosis, and ultimately, if we can improve the fibrosis or prevent the fibrosis to progress. To just give you a taste, the first class is FXR agonist, and it can cause carbohydrate improvement in carbohydrate, lipid metabolism improvement, and insulin sensitivity. And the main medication which is available right now in the clinical trial is obeta-colic acid. You may have heard about the primary pillory cholangitis, which is recently approved. It's an FXR agonist, which we're going to talk about. Insulin sensitizers, the two main is the PPR agonist and GLP-1. And ilafibrinor, which is GFT-505, and liraglutide are the two main medication in this category right now. The modulators of lipogenesis, the LXR inhibitor, the Altipress is in the phase two trial. Both ACC and ASK inhibitors are in the phase two clinical trial. Anti-inflammatory and anti-apoptosis are the caspase inhibitors, which is emricasin and chemokine receptor. And the last one are the antifibrotic. So two main antifibrotic, which are in the phase two clinical trial, are the monoclonal antibody for this LOX2 inhibitor, which is a inhibit the extracellular matrix and prevent them from fibrosis. And there's a Gilead medication called Simtuzumab, and we are evaluating it in both cirrhosis with NASH and advanced fibrosis in NASH. 
and the collectin-3 inhibitor is also in the phase two clinical trial. So it's a race to the finish line. Since there is no FDA-approved medication, the companies are very eager to get first FDA-approved medication for NASH. And there is one, uh, I'll give you an idea about what happened with the press release of some of these medication and how the stock prices changes for a company. So the four medication I want you to give you an idea about, are the first is obetacolic acid, the GFT5 for five, Senesrovaric, which is CVC, and the Simtuzumab. So as I talked about, this FXR is a very complicated system, but obetacolic acid is a synthetic file acid for kinodeoxycolic acid. It has a hundred times more affinity for FXR uh, activity, and when you increase the FXR activity, it activates fatty acid synthesis, it shuts down the bile acid, and it also has uh, receptors in the intestine, and that's where it mediates the insulin sensitivity by activation of TGR5 activation. And therefore, uh, for all these reasons, it has also had a role for primary biliary cholangitis because of their shutting down the bile acid synthesis. So um, our group paper from NASH CRN was published this year. It's an FXR receptor lichen for uh, non-serotic, non-alcoholic hepatitis, uh, which is the Flint trial. So our primary endpoint was, again, improvement in NAS score by greater than two points and no worsening of fibrosis. So if you compare the obetacolic acid 25 milligram versus placebo, 46% patient in obetacolic arm had achieved the primary outcome, meaning they have an improvement of NAS score of greater than two with no worsening fibrosis as compared to placebo, which is 21%. The duration of the trial was 72 weeks, and the uh, trial was terminated early, so the last 64 patients did not have a liver biopsy because we reached the pre uh, determined the endpoint. Not only the it improves the primary outcome, but across the group, the steatosis, inflammation, and ballooning was improved in patients who were on the beta-colic acid 25 milligram arm. It has improvement in fibrosis, uh, but if you look at the NASH resolution, which I had a, a definition before, was achieved in 22% patient with OCA versus 13% in patient with placebo. It had a very good drop in ALT, GGT, and body weight. So interestingly, this was surprising for most of us that actually patients on obetacolic acid lost about 2.3 kilogram weight. but the uh, there was slight increase in alkaline phosphatase, which we cannot explain what was the reason. But the things we were worried about is that patient on obetacolic acid has increased in total cholesterol, also had decrease of HDL and increase of LDL. So definitely a medication we're using for NASH, with we have to understand what the other metabolic risk factors. So that was one of the concern for the study. Not only that, if you look at the lipid changes on obetacolic acid in the primary pillary uh, cholangitis trial, they also had a little bit complicated graph, but in short, the HDL also decreased in patients with PBC, and there was a slight increase in LDL. But when they went to the open phase, that difference went away. But we have to keep a close watch on it. What is meaning of it and whether it's clinically significant, we don't know but we have to realize it and understand a little bit better in our phase three clinical trial. The major problem with obetacolic acid was severe pruritus. So 23% patient in obetacolic arm versus 6% in placebo had pruritus. So the summary for the Flint is that it does improve the histological features of NASH, including fibrosis, but obetacolic acid was associated with pruritus it does cause increase in total and LDL cross cholesterol and decrease in the HDL cholesterol, which we need to understand a little bit better. So there is an ongoing phase three clinical trial called Regenerate, which is comparing about uh, two dosages of obetacolic acid, 10 milligram and 25 milligram versus placebo. 
and the plan is to enroll about 2,000 patients for 18 months with four year further follow up. So these kind of the study that we can see whether there was an improvement in fibrosis and what to look out for the cholesterol. So the other interesting agent was 12 uh, PPR alpha and delta agonist GFT505, also called elefepronor. So it does do a lot of different functions, but it does uh, inhibit this SR, which is sterol receptor. And when to stop it, it shuts down the fatty acid synthesis and activate beta oxidation. And the alpha component have also improved the insulin sensitivity peripherally. So it was very promising that it will gonna improve the hemoglobin A1C and cholesterol because of its effect. So how did they design the study that they took 270 patients with a biopsy proven NASH and there were three arms, the placebo, 120 milligram arm, and 80 milligram. So the study endpoint was interesting that they wanted to look at resolution of NASH, but the, their fibrosis definition that it has to have improvement in fibrosis, and there's no progression of fibrosis to stage three or stage four. The problem is that it was a 52 week study and majority of half of their patient have either no fibrosis or F1 fibrosis. It was not long enough to get that. So after the study was done, they changed their, they have this modified endpoint. So what they changed the endpoint to the normal resolution of NASH with no worsening fibrosis. 80 milligram of GFT did not have any benefit, but they, I'm just showing the comparison between placebo and 120. So protocol defined outcome, which was resolution of NASH and no worsening of fibrosis to stage three or four, it was not any statistical significant. So 21 person patient in 120 milligram arm and 17 person in placebo arm. What about the modified definition? So that's where you started looking at the change. So 19 person of patient versus 12 percent. And when they look at the more strict criteria, the NAS score. Interestingly, it was one of the big multi-center studies and a lot of patients got into the trial with a NAS score of about three. And when they look at the NAS score of greater than four, it starts showing the benefit. So it was 19% versus 9%. So this drug, the Lenfibrinor, also resolved NASH without worsening in higher proportion it improved the lipid parameters and glycemic control. I did not show that data. But it also had seven patients in the 120 milligram had worsening of the renal function, which is very surprising, and we don't know what the reason for it. This is the second medication, which is in the phase three clinical trial. So there are only two medications, opetacolic acid and GFT505. And this trial name is Resolve IT. And it also wants to enroll greater than 2,000 patients. And the focus of both clinical trial is to get patients more in F2 and F3 fibrosis, which needs more urgent treatment or medication. The third study, uh, it's uh, going to be late breaking abstract for ASLD this year. It's efficacy and sef uh, safety of CVC or senesrovoric for non alcoholic steatohepatitis with liver fibrosis. So they took the patient with NASH stage one to three fibrosis. They had 150 milligram daily placebo arm and their endpoint is two point improvement in NASH without worsening fibrosis. And they want to follow this for two years. So in September, they released at a, at a, as a press release their one year data. At one year mark, they did not reach any significant primary endpoint, so two-point improvement in NAS, no worsening fibrosis, were not clinically significant. However, the resolution of NASH, no worsening, no significant. But this improvement in fibrosis of greater than one stage was seen in 20% of patients with CVC arm versus placebo. So when they did this press release in September, their stock was at $4. And it went up to $40, which is 7 to 20% increase, and the next week, or same week, Alerkin bought this company for $1.7 million billion. So this is how the race is going on for Nash, because the companies want to be the first one to be FDA. But we, ha we are a long way from that right now. 
So last few slide about this very interesting Sintuza map, which is anti-LOX2. And the Gilead Pharmaceutical are doing two different trials with this medication. It's Nash cirrhosis patient, 259, and it's an actually IV infusion. They get it every two weeks. So it's 700 milligram, 200 in placebo. It's already enrolled. We have uh, a lot of patients on this trial. And the end point was uh, pressure uh, gradient and event-free survival, which is liver transplant, melt of greater than 15, and decompensation. And they have this open label phase for 240 weeks. They also had the similar design, but it's a sub-Q form, which they want NASH with stage three fibrosis. Their endpoint is increased change in the liver biopsy, which is morphometric changes, and event-free survival. Again, we have to see what the result will be, but this is the first antifibrotic agent, and their interest is whether they can reverse the fibrosis and improvement in portal hypertension. Uh, this medication also just got finished with uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis, so we just finished that clinical trial. We're waiting the results of it. Now, the future, we think, is the combination medication. So this is the trial we just finished with Gilead. Uh, they wanted 70 patients, but they have this ASK1 inhibitor, and they're using the anti-inflammatory with antifibrotic agent. So it's a newer concept. They have like five arm, but it's a proof of concept kind of a thing. They did release a press release last week about it, and it shows some promising results. So in summary, there are no FDA-approved medications for NASH right now. Vitamin E is still the main treatment for biopsy-proven NASH. The resolution of NASH and improvement in fibrosis is possible. There are several exciting molecules in clinical development for NASH and hepatic fibrosis, but we need to better define the primary outcomes, predictors of response, and duration of studies. And combination therapies are on the horizon. In conclusion, in the future, a more personalized treatment approach can be envisioned based on specific metabolic and liver disease profile. Combination of drugs working in complementary or synergistic way are likely to be the future of effective NASH therapy. I would say that still we are about four or five years away from any of the FDA-approved medication. So um, as you know that we do have this big NIH-funded uh, NASH CRN. We're always doing more, so we had enrolled, finished a lot of clinical trials, but right now at UCSF we have the Regenerate Resolve. We have the GS0976, uh, we just started enrolling, and this new medication, Emory Sarkin, also in the phase two trial. Again, I would like to thank all of my mentors, Dr. Bass, Dr. Turo, Francis Yao, and Marion Peters, Dr. Brandman, who is holding the fort behind us, who is my colleague in fatty liver disease, Monica, who does a lot of fatty liver and PCOS, uh, Rohit Lomba, who is also my mentor at UCSD and helped uh, with some of the study designs and a big name in NASH and also helped with some of the slides. And my coordinators, and some of those names are because Jen Lyon share a lot of coordinators because they're so awesome. So Rachel, uh, Claudia, Alina, and Yara. And thank you. And please uh, make sure that you change the clock on Sunday. And when you go out, for what don't bring countries back 50 years back, okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, yes, Dan. You can repeat the question. Okay. Uh, so the question is what the effect of bariatric surgery? So there is a lot of data that is a bariatric surgery, but if you look at the ASLD guideline, they're not recommended as the first line or second line treatment. So, uh, you know, the weight loss data we have available, and that's again that there are patients when they got the bariatric surgery, the initial data that majority, half of them had resolution of NASH and improvement in fibrosis. So that is one of the big thing. But at the same time, there's another study that came out that after three years when they did repeat biopsy, the fibrosis did not have any significant improvement. So that becomes muddy the water, but we do recommend patients who have significant metabolic risk factors are not able to lose weight, and that if they can consider the weight loss surgery, it will also a good option. But most of the patients, when you talk to them, they are not interested in it. Charlie, last question. Uh, 
you know, we, uh, we have our Pete's colleague, Emily Woodfield, like we are seeing it across every age group. And it's becoming like youngest patient I have seen from Phil is like 17 year old with cirrhosis of the liver. And I think it, we are seeing this epidemic and what we started knowing, the more questions are actually arising. There's a lean BMI, the lean group with fatty liver. What are the genetic factors? What are the environmental factors? So we're still at the tip of the iceberg. And therefore, I think we are working more with these medications, but there are a lot of things. And if you look at the placebo versus any of the medication, the response rate is 40%. So we are nowhere near, and we need to learn more about it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So thank you, Bilal, and a very interesting talk.